Hello, and thank you for joining us for Reports from the Field, direct for, from Climate for Health Ambassadors. My name is Sydney Otis, Network Engagement Manager with Eco America. I'm joined today by four remarkable Climate for Health Ambassadors who represent the range of health professionals that participate in the Ambassador Program. Thank you, Cassandra, Milagros, Greg, and April for joining us today, if you all wanna wave hi. Thanks for being with us. So your geographic background varies as much as your expertise from Arizona to Georgia, to New York, to Oklahoma. These ambassadors represent the nursing, academic, research, and community side of health. And for context, Eco America's ambassador training equips leaders across the health, faith, and community sector to be effective climate advocates. The training covers climate science basics, the impacts of climate change on people and communities, climate solutions, how to craft an effective message, and the spectrum of advocacy. The Climate for Health Ambassador training hones in on the unique role health professionals have in the climate space as trusted messengers. The training is available on demand online through our learning management system. It's free and available on our program websites, and you can check it out right now using the links in the chat. At the end of the training, ambassadors sign an advocacy commitment and join the ambassador program where Eco America continues to develop their capacity as an ambassador um, and as an advocate through customizable resources, a private online community of other ambassadors and ongoing staff support. Climate for Health ambassadors are on the ground doing the work, living their climate values, and now you'll hear from them on what that looks like. So Cassandra, my first question is for you. We've heard this statistic a lot from the research at Eco America. 75% of Americans are concerned about climate, but don't believe as many people around them share that concern, only 14%. As a lecturer at Arizona State University and a co-chair for the Environmental Health Communities of Practice at the Society for Public Health Education, can you speak to the role that education at the university level or through trainings like the Climate for Health Ambassador training has in bridging that gap in talking about climate and what success have you had in integrating the climate and health connection into curriculum? Yes, thank you, Sydney. Um, that's a great question. And I think we all need to be visible and we need to be vocal because the truth is the majority of Americans do care about climate change. And so we need to remember that. And what is exciting is the solutions for climate change are vast. And we really need everyone at the table to be a part of that conversation. And you know what? We need teachers. Um, the science is clear. You know, with climate change, there will be human suffering um, in a warming climate. And so we really need to prepare our healthcare workers for this new reality of this human suffering that may be coming. Um, it's very important that we do that. And so I believe that in the educational setting, whether it's K through 12 or higher ed, we need to prepare our students um, and our future workforce. So whether that's um, you know, our medical study students, our public health students, counseling, healthcare delivery, we all have a piece to play here. We must educate them because we're sending them out into this world. Like, they need to know. Um, I am a lecturer at Arizona State University, and I teach community health educators. And I think we do a great job preparing our students for a variety of topics, whether that's in substance use or diabetes or nutrition. Uh, but I noticed that there was a gap, and we weren't preparing our community health educators in climate and health. So I created a class um, because I didn't feel good about sending my students out into the world without this information. Um, and so now with this class, our students are prepared to plan climate and health programs and to look at climate and health hazards and go into this workforce with their eyes wide open and do good work in this field and that they're prepared to do so. Um, so it's something I really encourage for you educators out there is to consider adding a class or just a workshop or just a one day lecture on climate and health. Um, and so that we can prepare our future workforce for this reality that we're stepping into. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you, Cass. And that's so exciting uh, to hear about your work in your class. Thank you. 
My next question is for Milagros. Millie, you were an oncology nurse for 25 years, and now you're involved with several different professional organizations, including the Oncology Nursing Society and American Nurses Association. In the Climate for Health Ambassador training, we talk a lot about health professionals as trusted messengers who have a unique opportunity to disseminate information, and nurses are a great example of that. So since taking the training, how have you started using your voice and your expertise to make that climate and health connection for others? Thank you, Sydney. Um, yes, taking the training allowed me personally to better understand as a healthcare professional, the interconnectedness that climate change has to things like air pollution, uh, vector-borne diseases, extreme weather events, food insecurity, um, and so much more. Um, things that are harming our health and taking millions of lives every year. And more importantly, how we respond to climate change matters for health and equity to protect those who can't protect themselves, but are who are the most impacted. Now, as a profession, nursing as a whole uh, came to climate debate, the climate debate early and is actually very well positioned to expand its role in this particular area for three reasons. One, we comprise about 60% of all healthcare professionals. That includes medical doctors, um, midwives, dentists, pharmacists, the list goes on worldwide. And so our collective potential to change the trajectory of climate action is really unparalleled. Secondly, nurses are the most trusted profession, according to the US-based Gallup poll for the last 19 years, I'm very proud to say. And thirdly, nurses are close to the people who are most vulnerable to climate change. Most nurses work for people, or I should say many nurses, uh, excuse me, work for people who are underserved, marginalized, or both. So to answer your question more succinctly, uh, the critical information provided by this program, along with its supportive leadership and thriving online ambassador community, has allowed me to engage with those in healthcare leadership and legislative advocacy with clarity and confidence. Being able to combine this education with my specialized knowledge set as a nurse practitioner has allowed me to elevate climate change and decarbonization as a healthcare priority, particularly in light of its impact to, again, our most vulnerable patient populations. I've accomplished this along with the support of an expansive network um, by in January of 2022, I was honored to be appointed to the American Nurses Association Innovation, Innovative Advisory Committee for Planetary Health. Uh, here, I was able to introduce the major concepts learned in Climate for Health Ambassador training. Prior to that, in December of 2021, as an active member within the context of the health policy branch of the National Oncology Nursing Society, I was invited at the annual Capitol Hill Advocacy Day to speak uh, on a focus of environmental health policy issues and its impact on cancer care. And previous to that, in the, in the spring of 2021, I was instrumental in helping initiate an environmental health climate change and healthcare sustainability focus group at that same uh, organization, the Oncology Nursing Society, with 30,000 members strong. So this group has grown exponentially since its creation, and its purpose is to offer educational resources to nurses and ultimately to our patients. Thank you. That is great, Millie. We're so lucky to have you as an ambassador. All of that is just amazing. Um, and April, my next question is for you. Um, as a tribal liaison for the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, you do workforce development, education, and research with more than 68 tribes. How do you balance those programs? How do those programs balance doing the work to stop the causes of climate change while also dealing with the impacts that are impacting people now? Yeah, so being a part of the ambassador program has inspired me to develop um, tribal health and climate change trainings um, for uh, the tribal staff in our region. 
And so um, the ambassador program has provided me training materials, um, resources on these topics, and helped me create a network with health professionals um, and encouraged me to reach out to tribal health professionals and organizations as well. Um, and so one of the things that I think is important is that we can motivate people to take action by appealing to what we call co-benefits. And so for me, it's about what tribal communities care about. And so it's, it may be you know, things like culturally significant plants and food. It may be um, you know, maintaining and revitalizing our cultures. And so to answer your question, um, we talk about ways to um, stop the uh, causes of climate change with tribal communities by um, talking about things like storing carbon and soil health practices on in tribal agricultural lands and their practices um, with their traditional farming and foods. And we also um, help tribes deal with the impacts that are happening now by assisting them with tribal adaptation plans. And tribes are leading the way in this area. Um, and it's so inspiring to see all the things that they're working on and that they're including health in their tribal adaptation plans. And so one of the examples of um, one of the cool projects I have is we've been looking at mosquitoes and um, we've been doing tribal youth outreach and um, outreach to tribal health professionals to develop monitoring and surveillance programs. And so through that, we have learned so much about mosquitoes and vector-borne diseases and even birds that are the carriers. And so one of the cool things I learned is that you can actually take the blood from birds and identify what mosquito and their DNA. And so that was really cool to me and a whole new area of research that I never thought about um, that you could do. Um, and so it's been really um, interesting and, and we're uh, looking forward to presenting at the National Indian Education Association Conference coming up this fall as well. Um, so it's just been really inspiring for me and I really appreciate the time to uh, talk with you guys today. Thank you. Thanks, April. I always love hearing what projects you have going on. They're so interesting. Um, and Greg, my next question for you. Um, from our research at EcoAmerica, we know that 79% of Americans have noticed more severe heat waves in the past few years. And working for the city of Decatur, Georgia, you see the harm extreme heat has on unhoused people. And a major component of the ambassador training is learning how to communicate effectively on climate, starting with focusing on people and the impacts that we can see. So what role does communicating through stories play in making sure unhoused people are included in climate policy going forward? Good afternoon, everyone from Decatur, Georgia. Uh, just about, I'm east of Atlanta. I just wanna say welcome and I appreciate, appreciate this opportunity. Uh, for me, I just want to say first about the training. It was wonderful to go through the ambassador program. It was a breadth of information, just as you can see here now, how we expand our network and the great work that everybody here and all across the country that we are doing. But one of the things that we talk about heat, and in, in Atlanta and Decatur, Georgia, it gets it really extremely hot. And for me, it's a passion about the unhoused, a homeless population. I think it's so important to be thinking about People in our community, I told someone, we have three easy access ways for unhoused people can get to our community, they feel safe. But I told someone during the, we talk about heat, we talk about water fountains in our community. Uh, during the pandemic, you know, water fountains were closed and we were all were thinking about how do we take care of people on the street so we're able to have some portable water fountains. Uh, I told somebody, we take a lot of things for granted in this country. You know, we think that people have access when we talk about the unhoused population, I told someone, um, and in the chat, you may want to show, uh, we have a, what I call it's our food pantry, where we try to provide water. Uh, we provide water for people that are unhoused. Uh, some people like it warm, some people like it cold, but I told someone it's important that we give people access here in our community. I'm on the recreation side, so some of you might say, how are you involved in this from a public servant? I'm the recreation director here for our city. We have a lot of unhoused people here in our community. 
Uh, we welcome them here. Uh, I tell somebody between the library, the churches, and myself, we all about making formal relationships. That's a big piece as far as developing trust with them first. And then we look as begin to have that relationship and how do we begin to address the issues as you talk about heat wave and all the water. We use our parks right behind us. Our park system is important. Trees are important to us. As you can see, also cover shelter. We let cover unhouse. They can house into in our community garden as long, at the same time someone is out there working on their garden laws, they follow the rules. So I just say when you talk about climate change, you talk about access, we talk about writing policies to make sure you talk about heat wave, how do we keep people hydrated? I was saying the same time, think about heat, not having water for people that are on the house, that's potential for heat stroke. So that can be, it takes us down a whole nother avenue. So I would just say to everybody that's out here, one of my challenges would be, do you know where all your unhoused people are in the community? Do you know where they are? If you don't know where they are, begin to figure out someone in the city or your community needs to become a champion, climate change champion, unhoused champion, how you work with your partners, nonprofits, churches, how you begin to address. And heat wave is one, one piece of the equation. We're big on our end. It's cold in Atlanta. So I'll let y'all know two weeks ago, temperatures went to 20 degrees during the daytime here in March in Atlanta. And someone's like, Greg, why are you out here riding the streets? 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, I want to see what's happening with unhoused populations and we're trying to get people in the warmer stations. And for our community, just to let you all know, this whole climate change piece is so important. In our county, there are no warming stations except for a fire station here in our county. And the fire station can only house maybe about eight or 10 people. So what we're trying to figure out in this in this community how we have better facilities. We talk about extreme heat and extreme cold weather. Yeah, thank you, Greg. I always learn so much um, hearing about the work that you do and it's really opened my eyes and uh, I've gotten more acquainted with the unhoused community in the DC area and how we can support them during heat waves and extreme cold that comes out of nowhere like it's happening right now. Um, and thank you all so much for sharing. Um, I'd like to take some questions for the audience if they want to send those in the Q&A area of the platform. But first, I want to ask, um, what is the benefit of being part of a community like the Climate for Health Ambassador Program um, on your climate advocacy? So Millie, I'll, I'll let you start with that one. Yes, thank you, Sydney. Um, the biggest benefit to me is um, as a healthcare professional, finding a group of like-minded um, persons that are extended beyond the healthcare community, because believe it or not, crossing sectors matters. Making, to Greg's point, making those partnerships, making those collaborations matters. And so this was an optimal uh, opportunity to do that uh, while, it, you know, in the bubble of the training and now it, by extension through the uh, community. Great. Thank you. Does anyone else want to chime in on that, the power of the community for advocacy? And I mean, I guess with me, I just think about we get a lot of updates. Uh, we got resources until somebody look at everybody here on this call and you start thinking about how all the cross sections for us, you know, students, I told somebody people are going to start retiring. I told somebody as a manager, you start thinking, sometimes we start thinking how we provide services. But I told someone we're in the midst of a recreation master plan and I was just thrilled to see we kicked this off yesterday, but I was thrilled to just to see the topic about homelessness being addressed in infrastructure and policy and how we look at buildings, how we look at parks. So you start thinking about this great work everybody here on the screen here is doing. I just think you can just expand your breadth of networking. I always tell somebody, don't re reinvent the wheel, just network with people. Be surprised how you can find and learn to educate yourself. Yeah. Definitely, that's exciting to hear about, Greg. I liked your email about that. Um, Cass, what motivates you to continue your climate advocacy work? Uh, that's a great question. And I think it circles back to what we were just talking about. 
And it's, it's all about not being alone. Like, I think sometimes we can really feel like this crippling anxiety when we're looking at this huge problem of climate change and the human suffering that may happen in the next 10 to 20 years. But then taking a step back from that and looking locally and looking globally at what is being done can be really motivating. And we're not alone in this fight and really recognizing the actions that we each can take together as a unit can be very inspiring and I think for all of us just trying to imagine that future what it could be like a real safe place for our children and our grandchildren motivates me to to get up in the morning and to do what I do Um, we're all in this together and just taking taking a step back and remembering that's very important yeah yeah I know I'm doing it for my my niece and my nephews so that the children are a huge motivator definitely Um, April, can you speak on how you use the communication guidance from the ambassador training to talk to climate, uh, talk to people about climate who might otherwise find it a little bit polarizing or, you know, overwhelming? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, these communication tools that the ambassador program provides us and helps us figure out how to have these conversations and connect with the communities, right? So again, those co-benefits of, hey, I'm talking to this community about this, but what about health and where do I bring that in? And um, and so, you know, tribes are doing health and have health issues, but they're not thinking about climate change in those, in those plans or in those efforts. And so I think it's really important to, to think about um, where we can connect with people and where are those opportunities and and make it relevant um, to them. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Anyone else wanna chime in on on how you talk to people who, you know, might be on the other side of the issue or just, you know, not really tuned in so it might be a lot of information? You can can see behind me, go ahead and jump in there. All right, I'll be brief and then you can go. Um, I think it's all about finding the common ground. And I think remembering that, you know, we all have different perspectives on things, but we do stand on common ground and really trying to connect on what that is. And, you know, of course, like clean water and children's health, those are the big ones. But you know what I found? Mosquitoes. Everybody has an opinion about mosquitoes. That can be your hook in and then just connect with that person. And remember, we, we're all on the same planet. We all care about many different issues. Just find out what that connection is and then have a conversation and be curious. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, well, I was gonna just advertise on my sign behind me. We got this whole theme in our community, the K that cares about climate. Uh, I tell somebody, you start thinking about, people got different interests, but at the same time, I think you nailed them on how we, we all care about environment, we care about people, we care about systems. Uh, we just had a whole town hall uh, around the homeless conversation and then you know that whole conversation what do we do how do we partner but the whole piece all of a sudden you introduced for me as an advocate introduced the whole piece about how does climate change impact unhoused so everybody began we the unhoused is the issue but then you put those two together and then there's really a lot of common interests a lot to talk about a lot to figure out how to problem solve this situation so that's just been my strategy as opposed to trying to tackle the unhoused by itself, I think it's important to, to bring in and wrap it in with another topic and you begin to have some strength with other partners and churches and nonprofits and other cities and communities and university systems. I love talking to students. I'm gonna do a piece and talking to some other recreation professionals. You talk about how we expanded beyond our community. I'm doing something on the state level to talk to people about climate change and the recreation field, but it's around unhoused because all across our state, you got unhoused people in our park systems. Yeah, that's a great point about starting with something they care about, like mosquitoes. I know I'm from uh, the co- like Gulf Coast of Florida, and so we deal with a lot of red tide, which you know goes with asthma, and the heat causes the algae blooms. So that's always anyone I talk to in my hometown is concerned about that. So that's a good way to kind of bridge that conversation too. Millie, do you have uh, thoughts on how you talk to, you know, maybe polarized or overwhelmed people? 
Well, I'm, I'm a big focus of what I do is um, what I call teach the teacher. So teaching nurses in direct care, um, how do they enter, um, how do they weave into the language that languaging that they're already using with their patients um, uh, and weave into that how climate is impacting them. So um, a lot of that has to do with looking at the really um, listening to the person in front of you and connecting with what matters. And I'm echoing um, my other ambassadors, uh, uh, you know, really addressing what matters to them. So, if, for example, if I had a lung cancer patient um, who's living in an area where there are um, increasing wildfires, well, this is going to be problematic um, or it can be problematic to breathing. So knowing how to talk about um, climate change and loss of biodiversity, and you don't have to get that technical, just get to the point and tell them what they need to know. And if you begin if by using um, languaging like, you know, uh, the air quality hasn't been that great today because of, you know, we've been having a, a series of wildfires. How are you feeling, you know, these days? Um, opening up the conversation, doing what I call motivational interviewing, which is really um, not leading, not like, you know, being real vigorous about trying to get your point across, but open-ended questions that allows them to engage with you. So in doing that, um, really just taking common everyday events and uh, bringing it, incorporating it into a, a conversation in a non-controversial way. So if you meet the resistance, I always say, roll back. You're not trying to dominate you're not trying to, you're trying to motivate, not dominate. And so going into the conversation um, with that mentality is, is much more helpful. Um, and so that's, that's my, my little perspective on, on how I address uh, people on the opposite side of the table with respect, with compassion, with grace. Yeah, I love your point about you're trying to motivate, not dominate, which it can be really hard when it's something you're so passionate about and you have so many thoughts and feelings about it. That can be one of the more challenging things is not dominating the conversation, listening and, and trying to motivate. Um, Eco America's new you know, tagline for this year is everyone every day. Um, so if we could end with each of you, you know, just saying what does that mean to you and looking forward to your advocacy for the rest of this year and, and onward, how do you plan to address everyone every day um, in climate advocacy. And uh, Greg, if you want to start. All right, uh, for me, I look at it uh, just being a voice. To me, it's just trying to be a voice every day around climate change, and most of all, just being a voice for those who are unhoused and not at the table. So to me, I always had the motto, be a voice, be an example, be a light, be a bright light for those people who may not have an opportunity to be at the table. So. That's my kind of motivation to move climate change, moving it forward. Cass, you wanna go next? Sure, yeah. One thing I really like about the ambassador training program is that it's accessible to many because it's virtual, right? And so, you know, if you're interested in this area, you don't have to take a formal degree program. You can learn tomorrow about this and dive in. Like every door is an open door when it comes to climate and health education. Um, and so once you take the training, you could start giving a brown bag seminar, you know, small workshops. It doesn't have to be so big. Um, and everybody has a place at the table here. You have a voice that needs to be shared. It's important to share that voice. And so um, I really encourage encourage you to to dive into this a little bit more and learn and engage and stay connected with all of us. I'll just I'll I'll you've all been so eloquent. I, I um, I'm really pulling from what you've already said. Um, but for me, it goes it always goes back to languaging um, and keeping it simple knowing that um, you know the CEO will understand you as well as you know um, your neighbor 
um, as well. Everybody should understand what it is that you're trying to say to them. And everybody should feel like it, it matters, like it would matter. Make it make sense to the person that you're speaking with. And so that's, that's my little thing. <laughs> And I guess for me, I'm, I'm at a university as well with CAS. Um, so it's all about the next generation, right? So planting that seed in the students, the youth, our next generation of tribal climate advocates, right? That, that I'm building my network and I'm growing that and there's lots of room and groups like this, we, you know, there's there's room for you. Come join us and come learn. And we're, we'll definitely um, share with you what we've learned. And that's all I would add. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, April. That was awesome. Thank you all for sharing your time with us today. Uh, everyone every day has the ability to engage others like we've heard. You can take the first step in advancing your climate advocacy by taking the Climate for Health Ambassador training or one of the trainings for our other programs, Blessed Tomorrow and Path to Positive Communities. The training's free, it takes about three hours. You can stop and start as you need to. And the Climate for Health Ambassador Training does offer CME and nursing CE credit. And after a short break, we'll be back and we'll hear from Dr. Bruce Bacar on how to care for yourself to care for the planet. Hi, my name is Mighty Fine. I'm an expert with the American Public Health Association, and today we're going to talk about climate change. In October 1998, Hurricane Mitch hit Central America, causing the deaths of over 11,000 people, along with massive destruction to property and infrastructure. Some people survived the storm only to die of cholera, malaria, and other preventable diseases, because when the health infrastructure broke down, diseases hit harder. This is a devastating example of how extreme weather can affect public health. And unfortunately, major weather events like Hurricane Mitch are becoming more common because of climate change. In the last several hundred years, people have been burning more and more fossil fuels. This releases an excess of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which trap heat and cause global temperatures to rise. Worldwide, this is causing a shift in the average temperature and weather over many years. In other words, changing the climate. And these shifts will affect our health, environments, and the way we live. Higher temperatures cause ice caps to melt and sea levels to rise. They also promote water evaporation and thus rain cloud formation, leading to more frequent flooding from rainfall. And as we saw with Hurricane Mitch, extreme weather like flooding and hurricanes will directly cause injuries and deaths and have other long-term effects. Like if flooded roads or down telephone lines disrupt people's access to treatment and prescription drugs, that can worsen pre-existing conditions that need ongoing care. But that's just one aspect of how climate change can impact public health. As temperatures rise, researchers predict heat waves will grow longer and more frequent, leading to higher numbers of heat-related deaths and illnesses. Like among immigrants who travel to the U.S. for seasonal farm labor, folks in agriculture are already 20 times more likely to die from heat illnesses than any other industry. The increased heat and higher carbon dioxide levels also promote plant growth. That sounds like a good thing until you consider the more plants means more pollen and extra bad allergy seasons, which can also impact chronic conditions like asthma and respiratory illnesses. And this isn't a problem for the future. It's already happening. From 1995 to 2011, allergy season across the U.S. extended by up to 27 days due to increased temperatures. Warmer climates can also increase the abundance of fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. So more of these critters means more opportunities to catch the vector-borne illnesses they can spread, like Lyme disease, malaria, West Nile virus, and plague. Higher temperatures and heavier rainfall will likely also increase the quantity of bacteria growing on our crops. That can make outbreaks of foodborne illnesses more common everywhere. And those same temperature changes and major weather events will disrupt the food chain distribution, potentially causing significant food spoilage and driving up costs. Limited and expensive food will increase rates of food insecurity, which is a lack of consistent access to enough food to live a healthy life. 
something that already affects almost 14 million U.S. households. Not to mention, these weather events can be so severe that they drive people from their homes, creating environmental migrants. In 2020, 31 million people around the world had to flee their homes because of weather-related disasters. In the U.S., the Biloxi Chiptamacha Choctaw tribe already moved once to the Ile de Jean Charles to avoid persecution. But because of coastal erosion and inadequate governmental action, they had to move again. All of this will have an impact on people's mental health, whether it's from the ongoing stress of a longer allergy season or the trauma of losing your home to a hurricane. Ultimately, climate change will affect everyone's well-being to some extent, and vulnerable groups most of all, like people with chronic conditions, older adults, and children. That's why we need to take action now to lessen the negative impacts of climate change. Planting trees in urban areas, expanding telemedicine for improved access, and prepping our homes for extreme weather are all ways we can build a more resilient society. Climate change is happening right now, but together we can control how much it affects our nation's health. Check out the Center for Disease Control's Climate Effects on Health and the APHA website to learn more. Thanks for watching. This video is a part of a series created by Complexly and the American Public Health Association to shed a little light on the important work that public health does. To learn more, visit APHA.org. So a public health institute is founded on a number of different beliefs. One of those beliefs is that we believe that uh, better health policy can lead to a healthier country, to healthier Americans. Um, and we come to work each and every day at our respective institutes to do just that, to think about and implement best policy, best research, best practices in order to bring, to improve the lives of everyone who lives here in the United States. States. Public health institutes are nonprofit organizations that work with multi sector approaches to improve population health. Um, they're very important muscles. Um, I don't think of them as bricks and mortar, but they're muscles to build health and to create opportunities for all people to be healthy.